Hello, I'm Dr. Rostenberg, and I want to personally thank you for checking out my YouTube channel. Stay tuned at the end of the video, and I will give my recipe for your healing process. Now, I wish we could achieve our results with just diet and lifestyle alone, but supplements really do make the difference. And to help you with that, you'll have an opportunity to order supplements at a discounted rate. We'll see you then. So of all the videos I've ever done and all the topics I've ever discussed, by far the most popular is the adrenal fatigue concept. And in, raise your hand in this room if you know where the adrenal gland is. Do, do, you, do you know where the adrenal gland is inside your body? Okay? So in the name, it tells you, if you speak Greek, I guess is where they get all these uh, words from, ad, above renal, above the kidney. So if they were below the kidney, they might have been called the subrenal gland. I don't know. Um, but the adrenals live on, on top of your kidneys. It's part of your endocrine system, right? They're a hormone-producing organ. And they get, the, they, get, they get beat up. They get very, very antagonized and injured, uh, sort of in the point of view of they get a death by a thousand cuts based on how our, how our modern society is uh, structured. So I want to show you this book uh, will give you a real general overview of adrenal fatigue. I think it's well written. It's easy to understand. But one of the facts about adrenal fatigue that's so frustrating is that it's one of the biggest health challenges that we will face. It's a real, real phenomenon. But medicine doesn't acknowledge that it exists. So if you go into your medical doctor and talk about adrenal fatigue, you're going, to be, you're going to be labeled, you know, one of those patients that you're reading too much on the internet, you're doing, you know, you're learning about things that, that aren't real. And, and the truth is, is that adrenal fatigue is legit. It's absolutely 100% causing problems in people's lives. And my job tonight is to show you how that works. I was just on the phone with a doctor in, New Ze in Australia, actually, who's a medical doctor, okay? She's a family practice medical doctor. She has adrenal fatigue. She goes and sees endocrinologists in her city, and they look her straight in the eye and tell her, her all of her hormones are normal on their tests, and there's, there's no such thing as adrenal fatigue. Okay, so they'll catch up. Eventually, they'll catch up. But by the time they catch up, how sick will we be and how sick will our loved ones be if we have to wait that long, right? So that's part of it. And the other side of the coin is, too, there's no drug or surgery to treat this condition. So if, you, if there's no drug or surgery to treat it, it, it just doesn't get the attention that other conditions get for obvious reasons. So hang on tight, because we're going to talk a lot about adrenals today. First, we want to look at our healthcare system. I know many of you here tonight, many of you who are you know, tuning into this information, you already know that our healthcare system uh, there's a problem, right? Uh, we're ranked, this was one study ranking us against about, oh, a, a dozen or so other countries, and we're, we're at the bottom of the pile. We spend the most, we spend the most, and get the least in return. That sounds like a pretty raw deal to me. Stress is going to impact depression pretty heavy, pretty heavily, okay? So, we all know somebody who takes an antidepressant, and by far and away, our country, we represent about 4% of the population of the earth, and yet we take about 25% of all drugs. So that's a little bit of a skewed statistic. So either we need to grow our population to catch up, or we should probably reduce our drug habit. That would probably be the smarter move, right? In certain, pop, certain groups of people, uh, you know, women in their middle-aged menopausal women, because their adrenals are so uh, imbalanced throughout life, uh, when women hit menopause, it creates a giant stress into their system because this whole time their ovaries were working when they were younger, producing hormones, and all of a sudden that stops. And so you have all this extra burden going onto the adrenals, and the adrenals are already worn out. And that's why up to one in, one in four women in that age group are on antidepressants right now. So it's just, it's, just, it's just a crappy Band-Aid to cover up the symptom rather than get after the, the root cause, okay? 
Make no mistake though, people who are depressed, people who are not feeling psyched about life are being poisoned by stress hormones. Now when I say stress hormones, for the rest of tonight, what I mean are two different things. On one hand, I mean the, the hormones that are fatty hormones like estrogen, they're made out of cholesterol, that's cortisol and aldosterone. Those are two hormones that the adrenal glands produce. Cortisol and aldosterone are the two hormones the adrenals produce. But there's also neurotransmitters that affect stress as well, and that one is called adrenaline. So we all know what adrenaline is. We've all had our heart beating out of our chest before. We've all you know, had a stressful event and raising your pulse and you, know, you start sweating and you feel agitated. Well, that's part of what adrenaline does to your body. So for tonight's conversation, when I say stress hormones, I mean all of those. I mean cortisol, aldosterone, and adrenaline, unless, you know, I'm going to point out something about each one individually. So high levels of adrenaline will depress you. People who are chronically stressed out are going to suffer depression because stress hormones are very irritating to your body. All right? Our ancestors developed, were given, were designed this system to escape from a burning building, a wild animal, a forest fire, a war, whatever. So it's this powerful system we have to uh, escape something that could end our life. Now the problem is we use this system every day in modern life. And that's not how it was designed to work. And so we pay the price for having chronic constant stress. And part of that is what adrenaline does. The other part of it is cortisol. They've done studies in the brain, okay? And you know, you've heard about the hypothalamus. Who here, is that a brand new word for anybody here, hypothalamus? How many people have not heard about that before? Yeah, it's part of your, hypothalamus is part of your brain that turns brain signals into hormones. So the hypothalamus signals the pituitary, the pituitary talks to the thyroid, for example. So you hear a lot of, people doing thyroid tests, they get their TSH number tested. Well, the TSH is the conversation between the pituitary and your thyroid. But there's a further conver there's a conversation between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. It's kind of like a domino effect. So the hypothalamus is in the brain and it turns neurological signals into hormone signals. But cortisol is so uh, problematic for your brain in high levels for a long time that it can it can damage and destroy the nerves, the neurons, the cells that live in your hypothalamus. And so what ends up happening to people is they end up with all kinds of hormone problems. They get low testosterone, they get low thyroid, they can't sleep, they can't produce melatonin, their growth hormone goes away, they can't burn fat. Um, a lot of these uh, afflictions that we're dealing with are due to the effects of stress hormones. I'm gonna get into all these little nuances as we go. So, so far, stress hormones in any form, whether it's adrenaline, whether it's cortisol, will make you feel depressed. So anybody you know who's depressed, maybe you've felt it in your life. I certainly have dealt with it before, before I knew what, how to get healthy and the steps to take to clean my life up and you know, do the right thing with my diet and exercise. De stress hurts, and one of the first things you're gonna see is, is depression. And that's not even one of the seven signs. That's not even one of the seven best signs that we're gonna go over tonight. Um, but right now I want to show you a quick video about stress hormones in the animal kingdom. If you're a normal mammal, what stress is about is three minutes of screaming terror on the savanna, after which it's either over with you or over with. For a few weeks every year or so, Sapolsky shifts his lab to a place more than 9,000 miles away on the plains of the Masai Mara Reserve in Kenya, East Africa. You live in a place like this, you're a baboon, and you only have to spend about three hours a day getting your calories. And if you only have to work three hours a day, you got nine hours of free time every day to devote to making somebody else just miserable.
They're not being stressed by lions chasing them all the time. They're being stressed by each other. They're being stressed by social and psychological tumult invented by their own species. They're a perfect model for westernized stress-related disease. Because what stress is about is somebody is very intent on eating you or you are very intent on eating somebody and there's an immediate crisis going on. When you run for your life, basics are all that matter. Lungs work overtime to pump mammoth quantities of oxygen into the bloodstream. The heart races to pump that oxygen throughout the body so muscles respond instantly. You need your blood pressure up to deliver that energy. You need to turn off anything that's not essential. Growth, reproduction, you know, you're running for your life. This is no time to ovulate. Tissue repair, all that sort of thing. Do it later if there is a later. When the zebra escapes, its stress response shuts down. But human beings can't seem to find their off switch. We turn on the exact same stress response for purely psychological states, thinking about the ozone layer, the taxes coming up, mortality, 30-year mortgages. We turn on the same stress response, and the key difference there is we're not doing it for a real physiological reason, and we're doing it nonstop. After a while, the stress response is more damaging than the stressor itself because the stressor is some psychological nonsense that you're falling for. No zebra on earth running for its life would understand why fear of speaking in public would cause you to secrete the same hormones that it's doing at that point to save its life. So an interesting look at stress from a, this, this individual, he's a really successful you know, PhD scientist, but he's studying baboons and how they get stressed out to extrapolate it back to see how we get stressed out. And the takeaway from that is animals like us are programmed to react to stress immediately for an acute life-threatening moment. And if they survive, then their stress goes away. They're on Tahiti again, they're on the beach, they're, they're backpacking, they're, they're having a vacation. And that's their life. It's, it's long periods of, uh, you know, fairly non-life-threatening non moments with, uh, punctuated by very life-threatening events. We've created a situation that is more challenging because we've created a chronic low level of stress that is actually more damaging than one big acute stressor that you go through and then relax from. So that's, that's in a nutshell why adrenals are so uh, problematic in our society. And you know, I wanna, I wanna stress that your body is perfect. Your, your body is absolutely perfect. We will never know all the little things and the uh, ins and outs of every aspect of your, how your body works. And we're not supposed to. It'd be, it'd be like knowing everything that's going on in outer space. It's never gonna happen. There's always gonna be something more to learn, another deeper layer to look at. But what you have to trust is, your body works perfectly the way it was designed and the way it is. And so your body is not hurting you. Your body is just reacting to the signals that it's being given. And we have to change the signals we give our body if you want your body to do something different. Yeah, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting something to change just simply doesn't work. So that's, with that in mind, we're going to look at some of the, you know, these are like the top nine causes of the, seven signs of adrenal stress, okay? So, uh, I know everybody in this room has gone through at least a, a couple of these, right? I mean, uh, not every, you know, we've all had stress in our relationship. We've, uh, maybe we've moved. And maybe we didn't have a job that paid us to move. They didn't come in and pack your house up and pay for the moving truck and buy you an apartment and all this stuff. I mean, very few people move uh, with that kind of support. So moving becomes extremely stressful, expensive. It's, it's risky. Uh, job changes, I mean, losing your job, uh, just uncertainty about whether your job is going to be there for you um, creates a profound amount of stress, especially in a, a breadwinner, um, somebody who's got the responsibility of earning money for their family. Um, not enough sleep. You'll find out that of, of all the vitamins and foods in the world uh, that you could take, nothing's going to do more for you than sleeping deeply and correctly. Uh, it's just, there's no... There's nothing that can do for you what sleep does for you, and sleep does an amazing 
The more, again, the more they study sleep, the more things they find, oh, it fixes that, it helps that, it prevents the leaky gut, it lowers the risk of diabetes, of heart disease, of all these different diseases. So if you're not getting seven hours a night of healthy, nutritious sleep, I don't just mean you close your eyes, you didn't hear noises and you woke up seven hours later. I mean like you literally slept deeply and you wake up feeling, oh, all right, great, I'm up now, I feel good. Without seven hours of sleep, your risk of uh, getting uh, health-related and stress-related problems goes up dramatically. So seven hours is a magical number. Keep, keep that in mind. Um, death of a loved one, man. You know, losing a family member, even if it's expected, even obviously worse, if it's unexpected, coping with grief, uh, financial stress, the economy, you know, despite what they say on, uh, you know, the talking heads on TV, the economy's not as great as it's been in the past. Um, Starting a business. I mean, these are things that I know about. I started a business. It's super stressful. And if you're not careful, you can, you can hurt yourself. You can actually chronically stress yourself out so uh, you, know, you, you deplete your, your reserve. And you can actually stress out your family members. I almost think it's worse for the, the wife at home who's taking care of kids because the person who's at home can't actively go out and make anything change. They're just sort of a, a victim of the circumstance. And then, you know, so. It's, you know, whether you're the guy out working or the, or, the, or the woman, the person at home is equally, if not more, stressed out than you are. And then, of course, chronic illness, especially upper respiratory problems. Or upper respiratory problems are very stressful on your adrenal glands. Gut problems are stressful on your adrenal glands. And the, the thing about the adrenal stress, what I think confuses uh, the, the established, you know, medical system is that these are functional type problems. They're sort of, they're there, but they're underneath a couple layers of other things. You have to know what to look for to find the evidence of the adrenal stress. And then major surgery. Anytime you cut the body open, anything, whether it's a C-section, an ankle surgery, you know, heaven forbid, a car accident or something else, you're going to have the adrenal gland go into absolute overdrive to, uh, you know, heal you. They produce anti-inflammatory anti hormones. Cortisol is anti-inflammatory. That's why people take steroid shots. I don't recommend that. Talk to the attorneys who represent the companies that make steroid shots. They'll tell you they're like, right? So that's not how it's practiced. So cortisol is strong. And when, you're, when your body's working well, you make enough of this anti-inflammatory molecule to, to stay balanced. So we'll get into all these things. But this chart I'm going to go over, over, I'm going to show you over and over again tonight. And it's a chart that I show my patients all the time. It's probably the most... It may be the most important slide that I ever put on the screen. Because what it does, it gives you a visual to understand what adrenal fatigue is. So what you're looking at on the far left side is a starting point where all the lines are in the same spot. And you can see over time, the red line goes very high, and then it eventually peaks and it starts to drop off and it ends up lower than it did before it started. Everybody can see that pattern. And then the other two dash lines, you can see they kind of trail off level and then they start to drop towards the bottom. So what the red line represents are adrenal stress hormones. So it's cortisol, it's aldosterone, and the other two are your sex hormones. So what, what this basically tells you is when you go into stress mode, when you go into fight or flight, your body's sex hormones go down while your stress hormones go up. Same recipe, same raw material. You can't you know, uh, you can only do so much with what your body has. So if it says, well, the, the need for cortisol is here and the need for testosterone is here. So, you know, sorry about that. We're going to just build cortisol to try to survive. And, you know, maybe next week we can work on making more testosterone and, and get back to feeling really good. So this is a little bit of a different representation of the same idea. Those circles show you the hormones that are going to get depleted in people. Progesterone, DHEA, aldosterone goes down. These may not mean much to you until you see the signs, the signs that these cause, the signs in people. We're going to get into that in just a second. But basically your body, again, is perfect. It uses cholesterol to produce stress hormones. And cholesterol also produces sex hormones. So people... You know, there are individuals that we, that we meet in practice that we talk to who their cholesterol is below 100. That's absolutely unhealthy. It's probably even dangerous. It's dangerous. Below 100, your cholesterol is just profoundly deficient. Below 150, your risk of uh, dying from an infection in the hospital goes up dramatically. So cholesterol is not an enemy. It's actually very necessary for health. This is a one giant big reason why. 
So oftentimes when we see low cholesterol in, the, in our practice, it means somebody's been through a, a, a stress response, an adrenal res response, where their, their body's just chewed up all the cholesterol it could get its hands on to make the stress hormones, and the cholesterol levels went down, and we're not yet they have not yet been replaced. See what I mean? Making all the stress hormones is going to lower your cholesterol. Low cholesterol is not a good thing. Not a good thing. So another n mm, negative side effect of cortisol is it basically causes what we would say is skinny fat. Okay, you go to the beach. You see two, you know, in shape people in their mid-40s and they got their swimsuits on. And you go over there and you pinch, you know, person A and you pinch person B. Well, there'll be two dudes for this, for this example, two guys. And you pinch them and you think, well, underneath the skin where I touched, it's about the same thickness, so they must have the same body fat. That would be the logical assumption, you know. Pinch the skin, you can figure out how much body fat you have. Well, that would be true if we didn't have this other body fat that we store deep around our organs. That's called visceral adipose tissue. It's very inflammatory. You know, it's secreting chemicals all the time that irritates your, uh, you know, creates inflammation, messes with your appetite, your sleep. So this was a uh, study done in 2007. You get two different people on the right and the left. I've shown this several times. But the person on the left is, is packing fat around their kidney. If you look uh, at the left side, right by that top arrow, top left arrow, you'll see there's a lot of white around the kidney. And you look at the same, same place on the patient on the right, and the fat's not there. So the person on the left basically has what we would call skinny fat. And when you have elevated cortisol for a long time, um, you end up with insulin resistance, okay? Cortisol is waste energy on, you know, stuff that's not important, like repairing your body or building sex hormones or planning for the future. Don't waste your energy on that. Get ready to run for your life or fight for your life right now. That's what cortisol does. So cortisol's job is to make sure that all the glucose in your bloodstream stays in the bloodstream and doesn't go into your cells. Insulin is doing the exact opposite. It's trying to take all the glucose in your bloodstream and push it inside of your cell so you can have energy and, and move. So you have one hormone doing, you know, pushing this direction, the other hormone pushing this direction, all they do is fight each other. So what you end up with is elevated levels of both. It really stresses out your pancreas to make all this insulin all the time. And then you end up with insulin resistance, and women you'll see it causes infertility, male hair patterns, it causes skinny fat. It's, it's stress, adrenal fatigue is like the ultimate uh, thing to study because it intersects all these different aspects of what we do in natural medicine and, and natural health care. So the first sign of adrenal stress, you're bending over in the garden, it's a nice spring day, it's 75 degrees, it's partly cloudy, it's a light breeze, it's 11 in the, after, 11 in the morning, you've been down for, a, been weeding for 30 minutes, moving around, and then all of a sudden you stand up, and then all of a sudden you can't see. And you get a little dizzy and your, your vision blacks out for a second and you, you're kind of like, you know, whoa, steady yourself there. Well, that's, a, that's a key indicator of an adrenal stress problem. And the reason you're about to learn, okay? Your adrenal glands are responsible for pushing blood uh, into your tissues, or, or I should say it a different way. Your adrenal glands have a huge impact on how your cardiovascular system moves blood around. So imagine you're trying to run like the zebras in that video from an alligator, okay? You're not gonna have blood in your stomach. You're not gonna have blood in your large intestine. There's no point in having blood in your ovaries or your uterus. You want blood in your muscles and you wanna get it in there as fast as possible because that's where the muscles get the nutrition they need to really get strong and move. So your adrenal glands push blood around. They help push the blood into your muscles. But when you, when you bend down and stand up, what happens is, you have to raise blood pressure really fast to keep it in your, inside of your head. And when you get dizzy, just from sitting down or laying down and standing up, your body is weak at that moment, and it's not able to squeeze the blood vessel tight enough to push the blood into your brain. So the blood's draining out when your body's trying to push it up. And then what happens is it drains out of your, the back of your head where your occipital lobe is, that's where your vision centers are. That's why you go blurry or you go dark for just a second. So basically, the part of your brain that controls vision gets drained of blood in an instant. And then your body tries to compensate and push it back in. So what happens is, what you'll notice is that people with cortisol that's elevated have high blood pressure, okay? People with low cortisol who are more in the low adrenal function 
have low blood pressure. So adrenal problems really come in two flavors and you can kind of vacillate between the two. You can go back and forth. You either have really high adrenal stress, you're totally, you can't sleep, you just have raging blood pressure, you're pounding pulse, you can't come down, you can't sit still, like you're just overly energized and overly stressed. And over time, that will wear out and your body eventually goes into the low function where you just, you gotta sleep 13 hours, you get up, you're dizzy. And what happens is, is with low, with low cortisol in your body, your blood vessels get weak and they can't squeeze and get tighter to push blood into your brain. So low cortisol, low blood pressure, that's adrenal fatigue. Key sign. And the one sign you see is dizziness. Especially like in the shower. We have a lot of patients, I shouldn't say a lot, but several patients over the last year who would say, well, I get up in the morning, you know, I go take a shower and I just feel terrible. I'm gonna, I like almost pass out, I get dizzy, I'm getting nauseous. What does a shower do? A hot shower opens up your blood vessels in your skin, so it lowers your blood pressure even more. And so it's making this problem, it's provoking this problem. So this is a picture I drew when I was in school explaining this to uh, my colleagues, my classmates. But basically when you're lying down, you can see the size of the blood vessel, the black <laughs> thing I shaded is pretty big. So when you lie down, you need less blood pressure when you're laying down than when you're standing. Okay, when you're lying down, you're this tall. That's how tall you are when you're lying down. You need a lot less blood pressure in order to keep blood at the top. Can we all agree? And now you stand up and you go from lying down to six foot three in one second. Well, you better increase blood pressure, otherwise you're gonna pass out. And so that's what, you're, that's what cortisol does. Cortisol and adrenaline help squeeze your blood vessels shut. Now what's gonna happen to the person who doesn't get this, the person who's dizzy a lot, who gets dizzy in the shower, something in their body will have to make up the difference. So what part of your body do you think will make up the difference? If your blood vessels aren't getting smaller, what part of your body has to work harder to keep blood in your brain? Your heart has to beat a lot faster. So it feels like you're running a half marathon when you're just doing chores around your house. There's no way you're gonna be able to tolerate exercise if your heart's already tired from just cleaning the garage and you know, doing your day-to-day -day chores. Make sense? That's where a lot of this t fatigue comes from. It's called orthostatic intolerance, if you want to look it up and do more research. Orthostatic intolerance, fancy words for I can't handle changing position from lying to standing is really what it means. And you get dizziness, you get fatigue, you get heart palpitations, your heart may pound, it may flutter. You're going to have vision problems, you could be dizzy as well. It's the second most common blood, it's the second most common uh, blood pressure issue besides high blood pressure. So all you hear about is high blood pressure, high blood pressure, high blood pressure. You never hear about low blood pressure being a problem. You never hear about low cholesterol being a problem. You never hear about low blood sugar being a problem. And so it's like part of this education process is recognizing there's optimum, there's too high, there's too low. You don't want to be extreme. Okay? But this is a really common problem. Dizziness, orthostatic hypotension, common problem, number one sign of adrenal stress is getting dizzy. Just more information, it's just, when you're really stressed out, guys, um, you know, I see most people in this room have a ring on, they have jewelry, you know, you feel it about three seconds after you put it on and then you don't feel it anymore. Is that, is that a fair statement? So your body ignores constant stimulus. If someone's playing loud music, it may bother you for five minutes and then you just tune it out. You know, buzzing and, and refrigerator motors, you tune it out. So your body will tune out something that's constantly going on inside it. So you can get insulin resistant, we've all heard of that. You can get cortisol resistant, you can get adrenaline resistant. So again, you don't wanna have high levels of these things that you're only supposed to have a small amount of. That's the moral of the story. Um, has anybody here heard of POTS syndrome? It's, it's sort of a more severe form of what I'm talking about. And certain people with this issue, they suffer uh, quite a bit. They get like uh, flushing in their legs, it seems, like all the blood pools in their legs because their body's so weak that it can't push the blood into their brain. Just like this picture shows. The red line when that person stands up, you can see the red, the blood is drained out of their upper body. It's really stressful to have blood leave your brain over and over again every day. So. <coughs> So that's, that's sign number one, dizziness. Sign number two is poor sleep. Everybody has experienced what a bad night's sleep feels like, and I hope everyone remembers what a good night's sleep feels like, right? 
Again, I'm showing you this chart so you can kind of see the two different types, two, the two flavors that this comes in. On the high side, when someone's going through a high adrenal uh, frame of, uh, you know, time frame, high adrenal experience, they're going to be very, ins they're going to have insomnia. Time going to sleep. The mind will just be racing, 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 thinking about everything else but sleep. Uh, you might as well get up and write a book, or clean your house, or work on a project because well, you're full of hormones that would help you do that at that time. So high adrenal, high adrenal activity, adrenal stress is going to cause insomnia. And really fatigued adrenals is going to cause like hypersomnia. It means that you may sleep 12 or 13 hours a day and feel a little, uh, just a little bit better or, or not better at all. So you may have to sleep half the day in bed just to function, just to barely get up and walk around and like, you know, go to the bathroom and make yourself some food and then you're back in bed again. So that's a very severe form of adrenal burnout. We want to really, you know, we don't want to get there. And if we're there, we want to, we got to make some changes quick because that, that can actually threaten your life. If you lose cortisol, you will not live. You cannot live without cortisol. It's that critical. So we have a lot of patients who are so, um, their cortisol is so low, they were given hydrocortisone just to function. And many of them are able to get off that uh, medication as they make these changes um, treating the root cause. So again, Catecholamines, high adrenaline makes it impossible to sleep. Um, who here has ever had a night terror or, you know, remembers their, like, a bad dream that they had that was, like, really intense? Yeah, I've, I've had that a few times. More when I was, um, you know, less healthy than I am now. But what's happening is when you're sleeping and you have a night terror, your body's releasing adrenaline while you're laying in bed. And the adrenaline gets released from your adrenal gland starts to bring you out of sleep but you're still dreaming okay so right before you wake up you remember what you were dreaming and because you're full of adrenaline you're gonna have one hell of a stressful dream right the adrenaline from your adrenal glands is gonna color your dream and, and make make you it's just the hormones in the bloodstream are coloring the dream so when you see people that are waking up with night terrors over and over and over again what you need to think is why is their body releasing stress hormones in the middle of the night. What's going on? There's a lot, there's a lot to that question. Great movie. Um, but yes, insomnia increases cortisol. So the, the less you sleep, your body has to depend more on cortisol the next day. Okay? So waking up with uh, you know, in, in, uh, incomplete sleep and running on fumes, literally you're asking your body to run on adrenal hormones. That's what those fumes are. Those fumes are cortisol. Okay, so sleeping enough, that good seven hours, nutritious sleep, you will live the next day with higher levels of cortisol, and that cycle will repeat over and over again until changes are made to bring it back down, until you get a good night's sleep or something else uh, happens. Now, there are, there are some people, again, so I just showed you two slides of people who are at the high end of stress. They can't sleep, they're insomniacs, right? Now we're talking about the narcoleptic person, the person who falls asleep all over the place. Some people, you'll be talking to them, you know, in a chair, uh, relaxing, and then you look over and they're just passed out. And you're like in, they're like in mid sentence and they just fall asleep. Well, what happens is, is they're literally losing dope, they're losing adrenaline and dopamine out of their brain and they're going to sleep, okay? If you have dopamine and adrenaline being released in your body, it's physiologically impossible to sleep. You, you cannot sleep when you're actively stressed out. You know, you can't, almost being in a car accident and then go take a nap five minutes later. But some people, because of their nature of their adrenal problem, they've gone through the high adrenal and now they're down into the low adrenal status and they've burned up all their adrenal. Their body can't even make enough adrenaline to keep going. And so they're just passing out left and right. They're falling asleep too much. This is also the person that's going to be sleeping maybe 10, 12 hours a night and not feeling rested. They'll also be falling asleep during the middle of the day inappropriately. It just means that their adrenals, they need help making more adrenaline. And there's natural supplements and foods. It's all natural way to treat it. Um, we're not really going to get into too much of that toward, until the end. Um, and then breathing. Breathing is a huge part of sleeping well. And, you know, it, it, I, I have young children and we watch a lot of cartoons. Um, as anybody with young kids knows, that's pretty, they're still pretty popular with kiddos. But they'll, they'll show like a sleeping scene, you know, Goofy's asleep, 
and he's snoring, he's like sawing logs. And there'll be another show and somebody else is asleep and they're sawing logs. And when the, the message that they're sending is that snoring is normal. Snoring is not normal. Snoring means you're having trouble getting air in your body. It's like, you know, the reason a musical instrument makes sound is because it restricts the airflow. Well, that's what that is. Restricted airflow, less oxygen. Your brain can't get enough oxygen. So snoring is a sign of a tired heart. Okay, so the same muscle in the back of your throat and your heart both run on a neurological circuit that is identical, right? So the laziness in the back of the throat, the weakness in the back of the throat is an indication of the weakness of the cardiovascular system. Okay, and it's also going to wake you up. If you can't get oxygen in your body when you sleep, it's really hard to sleep deeply. And you have four layers of sleep. You have alpha waves, beta waves. You can be asleep and not remember the night, but you're not sleeping well in alpha and beta. You're not sleeping well. Once you get into theta and delta waves, that's when the magic happens. That's actually when you heal, it's when you rest, it's when your body really finally gets into a, a state of rejuvenation. So when you have problems breathing while you're sleeping, and I'm touching my throat right here, because this is where the muscle's located that allows you to breathe with your mouth closed while you're on your back, okay? So you know in the cartoons when, you know, uh, Mickey Mouse is screaming and you can see his thing in his mouth jibbling back and forth or when you go to a doctor's office and he says say ah and they're looking to see you know does your palate move well that, that's the muscle it's like a muscular arch and it gets tired and it drops while you're sleeping every time it drops you start sawing logs and uh, you wake up and it stays open and then you drop again and you saw logs some more but we need to really work hard to help people in our life who are snoring. It's not normal. So the next time you see it on TV, just remember, it's not normal. It's just very common. And we get those two ideas mixed. It's not normal to snore. I love melatonin. I've been looking for the upper end of what makes it toxic. Is there a toxic dose of melatonin? And they did a study in, in mice. And they found it's 100, what was it, 100 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So um, uh, an average sized male would need seven grams of melatonin a night to reach toxicity. That's a phenomenal, that's a massive amount. That's like drinking a bottle and a half or two each night. So melatonin is safe, it's moral of my story. Very safe. And if what you have to do to sleep better is to take melatonin, then I'm all for it. Studies, studies show that melatonin is about like vitamin D. It's kind of a wonder, it's a wonder supplement. It has practically no side effect. Um, it's safe and if it's going to help you sleep and if you know if there's one little negative that melatonin does but it gives you 10 positives you're still coming out nine steps ahead you got to do it so melatonin is good for sleep and it decreases cortisol so the best antidote to high cortisol is sleep I mentioned that earlier but here's the data if you take if you have good melatonin and you sleep it, it tells the adrenal glands do not release cortisol the following day in the same way that it would without Melatonin is amazing. So no talk about adrenal fatigue would be complete without talking about fatigue. That's the third sign, okay? I've felt it. Gosh, I'm really tired. I would love to work out. I'd love to get these projects done and get my to-do, my honeydew list whittled down, but I just gotta like decompress and like, you know, sit down and rest for a little while, for a day or two. That means that I've pushed myself way too far. So fatigue is a key indicator of adrenal stress. And it really has to do with the thyroid, okay? So cortisol levels mess with your thyroid gland like crazy. Now, some of you in this room uh, may be on thyroid hormone right now. It's a real common, uh, common medication. And a lot of thyroid problems are actually adrenal issues that nobody, they don't know to look for that. So they, they just massage the blood test without going back and saying, well, why, is the, why are the blood levels off anyway? So you have two types of hormones. You have T3 and T4, just like this picture. They both have wheels, they're both red, they both get you from point A to point B, but one's a lot faster than the other, okay? T3 is way more effective at boosting your metabolism, and it's actually the active form. T4 is just much slower. Cortisol makes your T3 levels drop very far, so you end up with high T4 and low T3. So you get fatigue from that. You also have reverse T3 go up. So cortisol is going to save energy. If you're running for your life to try to get away from something or fight something, 
your body doesn't want you to waste energy where it doesn't need to be wasted. So it's going to kick on this whole domino effect of like save energy, don't burn that fat, don't, you know, don't repair that tissue, hold on to that fat tissue. We may need it, you know, it's a war zone, it's a famine, it's a, it's a crisis. That's what the, that's the, that's the language the body is telling itself by these, through these stress hormones. And when you have low thyroid hormone now, because stress lowered your thyroid, when you release cortisol, it stays in your body even longer. So it's like a downward spiral. Like the more cortisol you have, the lower your thyroid works. The lower your thyroid works, the longer cortisol stays in your body. It gets, that's why people get stuck. They, they, they kind of get dug into a hole and it's, they need a com comprehensive approach to get them out. But you can, you can get out. I don't want to pretend that it's, it's all lost. It's just cortisol definitely slows down your thyroid. Women who are on birth control, women who are on, who are on birth control have thyroid problems also. Absolutely. So, you know, there's an estrogen component to this as well. A lot of things that people would, would say are thyroid problems, I think, are, are adrenal issues as well. There's kind of, they, they mimic each other. They mimic each other. And the thyroid is just more sensitive. It's like your check engine light, you know? If you go, you're driving your car and your check engine light comes on, you take it to a very expensive, well-renowned, well, you know, well-known mechanic, and he goes in and he turns off your check engine light and says it's all good, that's different than figuring out why the light came on, right? Or cutting the engine light out completely would be uh, not the right way to take care of the vehicle. Well, the same is true of your, your body. So the thyroid, super sensitive. It just changes faster than other things. That's why, they, that's why they see it change first. But behind most thyroid problems are adrenal issues. Definitely. One, one testimonial here. Okay, we're here with Jo Lynn, who has been doing some work with us in our office for some uh, challenging symptoms she was experiencing. And Jo Lynn, would you just share with us uh, briefly what was going on with you when you first came in? Uh, I was experiencing um, uh, cortisol deficiency, adrenal fatigue, um, uh, high blood pressure of unknown origin, uh, muscle and joint pain, extreme fatigue, and had been diagnosed with um, a genetic defect with my adrenal glands and had just come off uh, major surgery, lost half of my left kidney, and had a septic episode that almost took me in the ICU a year prior to this. <clears throat> so did some genetic testing and found out that I had the MTHFR reductase deficiency, homozygous, meaning that I had the worst ability to methylate. And without methyl donors, the things that I went through the last couple of years was not going to get better. So um, started taking methyl donors, started taking um, antivirals, antibacterials that are natural, um, and some immune support um, supplements. And within the last four weeks, I've come from 70 milligrams of steroid support to between 10 and 12. Uh, that keeps my muscle and joint pain in check. Um, I am, um, I, the fatigue is just about gone. Uh, I'm out, able to exercise now. I'm doing some interval training and a little bit of weightlifting, which I've not been able to do any of that. Um, um, I, my blood pressure is normal. On, I was on Norvask and Micardis at 80 milligrams a day, and I'm off both of them. Not only is my blood pressure down, but it's 116 over 75, which is the best blood pressure you can have. And um, that's absolutely amazing. And um, I also did, I'm on a ketogenic diet that Dr. Rostenberg put me on. And um, my digestion's better, and my energy's better. And sure, sure. Everything. So, given given the progress you've made in working with us, you would you recommend what we do here to others? Absolutely. I would have to admit I was a little, um, you know, didn't know if I believed in kinesiology. I guess, but I have to say that after three years with traditional medicine. And four weeks, I feel like I'm myself again. Um, you need to give it a try. 
But ends up, what ends up happening is people with adrenal fatigue, they're not always your typical, oh, I'm just tired. Oh, I, you know, I, I just have insomnia. They usually have multiple things layered in. Now she uh, had an infection, okay, in her gut that turned into a kidney infection that what she said on the video was it almost took her in the ICU. Okay, she's a, metal, she's a healthcare professional herself, so she knows a lot about this, this type of thing. And she'd been trying to get over that for three years. So what we deduced by having that conversation and doing our exam and everything was that she still had an infection type problem. And the infection not going away is what actually kept dragging down her system. So her system had to spend all these resources trying to deal with this chronic infection and she's out there trying to exercise and move her body. She just couldn't do it. She was on 70 milligrams of, of hormones and in four, of, of steroids, and in four weeks she was down to 10. So, you know, it's pretty... And what we did, we treated the infection, and that's what helped her with her adrenal gland problem the most. So you can see that adrenal problems can come from different angles. A chronic infection is really stressful to your body. You may not know that you have an infection in your gut. You may not know that you have an infection in your, in your kidney, perhaps, but your body does. You have about 50 bits of information you can process consciously and billions of bits coming in subconsciously. So all this stuff is going on in the background until it gets really far along and it just shows up and boom, you find yourself maybe in the hospital you know, fighting for your life. But the good news is she's, you know, she's doing fantastic. Um, so blood sugar problems, blood sugar swings, having low blood sugar, not tolerating skipping meals, getting really cranky, having mood changes, all that stuff. Those are major adrenal signs, okay? We, we all know people uh, who probably have some form of diabetes who have high blood, pre blood sugar. It's just, it's just common. But I will, I will guarantee you that the person with low blood sugar is feeling the pain much worse, more often, and for a longer period of time. If you have high blood sugar, you kind of feel satisfied. You, you're full of, you're full of, you're living in excess. Living in excess is more comfortable than living in deficiency. Would we all agree with that? Now, being rich beyond measure has its own problems, but they're a lot different than being completely stuck in poverty. Poverty is a lot more painful. So think of it from an energy point of view in your body. When your body has an energy poverty situation, it's extremely stressful, extremely stressful. So some of the symptoms that you see with blood sugar, you see mood changes, people get super cranky, super cranky, and then they eat, and they're not cranky anymore. Or they're a toddler, literally kicking stuff and throwing stuff and freaking out and crying and you know, bashing and rolling around, and then 20 minutes later, they've got some food and they're their perfect little angel self again. Those are blood sugar swings. And the hormones that make you angry and make you moody, those are what like adrenaline does to you. So when your body, when your, when your body has low blood sugar, it's profoundly stressful. It's a, energy poverty is really, really, really stressful to your body. I'll show you how it works. But dizziness is one of the main signs of low blood sugar too. So there's a connection there. Just having poor vision, really, really tired, brain fog, being fatigued, and then all of a sudden you go and sit down and eat food and you eat like twice as much as all your friends and your family. And they're like, what's wrong with you? Well, what's wrong with that person is they just, they're, they're hypoglycemic. They wait nine hours without eating. And now they're so hungry that they, they stuff themselves full of food, but they're not going to digest that very well. When your blood sugar drops, when the arrow at the top goes down, that's when you feel the pain. That's when your adrenals get, you know, squished. You know, that's when they get beaten. And... It's the drop in blood sugar that hurts you. It's not the rise, it's the drop that makes you feel terrible. All those symptoms I just described come from the drop in blood sugar. That's the zone of misery when your blood sugar drops. It actually damages white matter in your brain. It's, it's, blood sugar is important. Living in an energy poverty situation inside your body doesn't, does not help. So they've, they've, they've shown in studies that it actually causes, you know, it causes brain inflammation. So people whose blood sugar is doing this throughout the day, you know, they're skipping breakfast, too busy, coffee, and then, you know, a little carbohydrate, you know, maybe a vegan muffin, just a bunch of carbs for a snack, and then, you know, they eat, maybe they snack on lunch a little bit, but they skip lunch, and then maybe they sit down and finally, at the end of the day, have some dinner. Well, their blood sugar just went like this throughout the whole day, and every time the blood sugar drops, they get a burst of adrenaline, 
Every time the blood sugar drops, they get a burst of adrenaline. So if the blood sugar is dropping five times a day, that's five times a day the adrenal glands have to produce hormones that they normally shouldn't. Does everybody understand that? So normally your blood sugar should be stable. You eat frequently, you prevent the drop in blood sugar by eating frequently. And if you eat frequently and graze, because when you're sleeping you're fasting, that's why it's dinner to break the fast. That's when you're supposed to fast. When you're in our modern stressful world where you're juggling 10 things at once, you better believe that you need to eat more frequently, not less. What is more frequently? I'd say two to three hours. Something You need to either have a meal or have like a couple hundred calories. Yeah, protein, nuts, absolutely. You know, low glycemic snacks. So this is a, a study on exercise. I mean, I don't know, I, I used to play a lot of soccer and I would, I mean, my health was not, was not great as a teenager. I would get really nauseous and sick like 15 minutes into a game uh, because before I started playing, I, I drank Gatorade and other things that raised my blood sugar really high. So, you know, Gatorade is basically like liquid Skittles. There's nothing good about Gatorade. It's, it's gross. Um, and stuff like it, it's just sugar. And so it, it jacks your blood sugar up and then once you start, once you start moving around on the field and, and running hard, then that drops your blood sugar really fast. And again, the drop in blood sugar makes you feel sick because your body releases stress hormones when your blood sugar drops. And one of the things, you're, one of the things that'll be new to many of you is a, is a hormone called glucagon. You can think about it as glucose be gone, all right, glucagon. It's from the pancreas. The pancreas makes insulin. When your blood sugar is high, the pancreas makes glucagon when your blood sugar is low. So it has two different gears it works on. The nice thing about glucagon is that it, it'll raise your blood sugar. So when your blood sugar drops, pancreas goes, whoa, we're getting low, man. It sends a signal to the liver, the liver will raise blood sugar. When your blood sugar drops, your adrenal glands do the same thing, except they use epinephrine. They use adrenaline. So you have two hormones that are get released when your blood sugar drops. One's called glucagon, the other called, the other's called adrenaline. The only problem with glucagon is that it shuts off your digestion. So every single time in your life when you've let your blood sugar drop, the next meal you eat will not be digested well. Okay, so how does that work? Well, if, you're, if you don't have enough energy, if you have low glucose, you don't have enough energy in your body, how can your body spend energy in the stomach to make enough juice to digest your food if you barely have enough energy to, uh, you know, run your brain or other systems? You see, it has five things to pay for, but it only has money for three. Something's gonna get, not gonna get covered. So the bill that doesn't get covered is digestion and repair. Make sense? It's too, super smart. Your body's super smart. Thank goodness. Otherwise, we'd be in real trouble. But here's a picture of the two hormones that go, that go to the liver. The, the little red balls are adrenaline. The blue, the blue, the blue ones are uh, glucagon. And, and they, they serve one purpose. It raises your blood sugar. That's it. So I used to be the kid. Uh, I would stay up late because I had, oh, I get, I get my second wind at like 1030. 11, 11, 30, 12, man, I could rock projects out no matter what it was. Doesn't matter if it's schoolwork or, you know, you know, art projects or construction or whatever. And what I was doing is simply letting my blood sugar drop, kicking on adrenaline and going, ooh, this feels good, let's go. Let's get some work done. Well, it's abusive to your body, basically. And the side effect of adrenaline is not very pleasant. We'll get into that. So that's, that's how it works. So blood, low blood sugar causes adrenaline to be released. Adrenaline is toxic, it causes adrenal stress. Make sense? Low blood sugar is a problem. Eat frequently, please. Please graze. You will, you'll lose weight if you need to, you'll gain weight if you need to, you'll sleep better, you'll have more energy, you'll lo lower body fat. It will not make you fat to graze. That is a false truth. It's not true. What will make you fat is skipping meals because it raises cortisol. Poor digestion, man. Everybody has a, everybody could improve their digestion and, and certainly from a clinical point of view, the place we have to start with patients is with digestion, okay? Because you can't give supplements to people, you can't give foods to people if they can't digest them. That's part of it. 
Interesting thing uh, during the research we did is that when you have a stress response, when you get stressed out of your gourd and you're just, wow, that was super stressful, you got really low blood sugar or you, know, you got in this big fight with your family, hopefully that doesn't happen very often, um, you're going to release a ton of adrenaline and half of that adrenaline goes into your gut. So 50% of the adrenaline you make gets squirted right into your gut and that may not mean much right now. But if you took the bacteria in your gut and you squirt adrenaline on it, it's going to grow 10,000 times faster. So the bacteria inside our bodies are listening to us. And if we tell them that the world is a super stressful place, we're in a constant battle for survival, they will take it as a cue that we're weak and they're going to grow more aggressive. It's a balance. If we give them other signals, they'll calm down and act appropriately. But you will, make, you will turn your gut into more of a, uh, infect, you're, you're, you'll change the bacteria in your gut by being stressed out all the time. Because the adrenaline gets squirted into your gut. And the bacteria feed on this stuff. It's crazy. 10,000% growth. It's massive change. They also allow, it allows the bacteria to steal iron. So normally iron is like guarded by our body. It's really important for us. But it also helps bacteria grow. Um, so if we have adrenaline, if we're, if we're under stress, the bacteria can get our iron from us and they can grow wild. A lot of people we see have anemia and uh, that's part of it. Part of the anemia we see is uh, everybody being so stressed out and the, the gut not absorbing the iron. Another problem of being under a lot of stress, as I said before, stress pushes blood into your muscles so you can run away, get the heck out of there. Well, that takes blood out of your gut. Can't be in the same place in two at both times, or at one time, right? So they've done, there's been reports of like triathlete, triathlon runners, you know, you think of these people as super healthy, but you're gonna, you, get, you gotta be careful. A lot of the, some of the sickest people I've, I help in, my, in, in practice are actually, you know, endurance athletes. And there's a, there's a story about a professional athlete, his name escapes me at the moment, but he's running this Ironman, he's like severe gut pain. He just keeps running and running and running and running and running. And he collapses like a mile before the finish line. And they rushed him to the hospital. They had to cut out two-thirds of his colon because it, it died. His colon died because it got no oxygen for like three hours during the, during the race. So that's, what, that's the extreme effects of stress have on our bodies. So your gut gets so beat up from stress. I mean, we've all felt maybe reflux or gut symptoms when you know sometimes that's all we feel when we have a stressful experience you know you go i mean you never you know maybe you go home for the holidays and it wasn't super it was a stressful moment and you you eat holiday dinner and you're like man that didn't sit well well it's probably not the food it's probably the stress and everything going on around you that's affecting that so in uh, another part of this pattern we see we see a lot of stomach problems so stress again if your blood flow gets shut off to your gut your stomach is going to become injured when you eat because a lot of the acids in the food and the acids in the digestive process can burn a hole in that stomach. Kind of like a sore on your arm that always gets irritated every time you eat. So the key to good digestion is to you know, practice good stress hygiene. That's a real big, real big player, okay? But one of the big signs of an adrenal fatigue pattern is somebody whose digestion is just not working well. They're gassy, constipated. They feel full all the time. It doesn't matter what, and it doesn't matter what they eat. It's not like if they eat bad, you know, processed garbage, or they eat really healthy food from the organic section over there. It doesn't matter. Their, their gut feels the same. What, we, what you're looking at is a problem with their digestive system breaking the food down. And when you're under chronic stress, there's no blood in your gut to do that. It just causes. Who here's heard of leaky gut before? All right. Who here uh, thinks they don't have a leaky gut? I don't know. <laughs> you can bet that you do unless you're making a world-class effort not to, would be my way to look at it. There's just so many things that cause the leaky gut that it can't be avoided. But you could, say, you could heal your leaky gut with, a, with the right kind of protocol and on Monday wake up with this great, beautiful, healthy gut. You got great sleep, you exercised correctly, you ate, you digested your food, you went Number two, you drink enough water, I mean, you're, you're dialed, okay? But if on Monday you start treating yourself poorly and have a giant stress response, by Thursday you could have full leaky gut again. So your gut, your gut is dynamic. It's just, and I say that just to give you the idea that your gut changes all the time. It's the fastest growing tissue in your body. 
So it heals quicker. Yes, sir, it heals quicker. That's the silver lining. Yeah, heals very fast. It, the gut is as big as half of a tennis court. If you spread the gut out and stretch it, you have half a tennis court. That half tennis court, the entire surface is born, lives, and dies every three days. So how much protein do you really need in your body to support that gut? It's quite a bit. And the gut eats one thing. It eats glutamine. That's, that's, the, that's what the gut eats. So if you want to make your gut healthier, use glutamine. We use a lot of it in our, in our practice. Um, colostrum is also really good at sealing the gut as well. So colostrum, you know, the first milk that comes out of a mammal's uh, breast to feed the young, the, the purpose of that milk is to seal the gut. Yeah. What is a leaky gut? It means that your gut is like a screen, like when you go camp, and there's a mosquito hatch outside, and you're in the tent, and you're really thankful that the screen is doesn't have holes in it. You know what I'm saying? And but you go to sleep, and some some little uh, mischievous person came through at night with a screwdriver and poked a bunch of holes in your screen, and now you have mosquitoes on the inside of your tent. That's not so fun. That's what a leaky gut is. It's holes in the screen. Stuff that should be kept outside your body is leaking in. Yeah, it just means that this, again, half tennis court size space, this 26 foot long tube, is developing little microscopic holes in the screen where stuff that should not leak in starts to leak in. It's a, it's a, good, it's a big question you ask. We'll, we'll work on that as we go. Okay, we're here with uh, our patient, Lindsay, and she just finished a intense week detox with me. And Lindsay, would you just mind sharing with us what was going on with you when you first came to see me? Sure. Um, when I first came in to see you, I did not feel good internally. I was bloated all the time. My runs were basically miserable. <laughs> um, I didn't feel well at all. My guts always hurt. Um, so, yeah, I just did not feel well. <laughs> and was the program that we put you through, how, was it difficult? Um, it's, yeah, I would say it's not easy, but you have to go in mind frame knowing that it was going to help you. And it definitely completely changed how I felt just in one week. One week I came in today and I feel a hundred times better. I'm not bloated anymore. My runs are more comfortable. Um, I feel I have more energy. I don't have to get up and get that cup of coffee anymore just to get going. Um, I'm able to just grab the shakes that you recommended and go out the door and my day starts off well. I feel more focused and um, more just I guess happy too, <laughs> in a way. So. Great, great. And so, would you'd recommend what we put you through to other athletes Absolutely. and other patients that are doing? Absolutely. Them? Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah. Good so, luck on your runs. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, nothing's more frustrating for an athlete who's really has a lot of talent, but they can't do what they love to do because their body hurts. And it's not like she had a quad injury or a hip problem. It was like her guts were killing her. Uh, because of the process we just talked about. I mean, there were a lot of stressful experiences. The blood flow wasn't working in the gut. The gut was very leaky and painful. And so we, that's, what, that's where we treated her, and that's what she was like a week later. And so people, you know, healthy people like that, strong patients, they change really fast. And you can see a big change in just a week. Um, so again, just talking about leaky gut, it basically means that your immune system gets really upset, and it sends a bunch of signals, inflammatory you know, fire into your body and that, that those inflammatory markers get pumped all over your body, they go into your brain, they, they set the alarm off. So that's the problem with leaky gut, is it always sets off the stress alarm, just like low blood sugar does, just like, uh, you know, not getting enough sleep does. So you can see people with low blood sugar, people who aren't sleeping, people with a leaky gut, they're always under stress, even if they are on vacation in, in Bali. It doesn't matter what plane ride you take or what destination you go to, you're still you. You're still carrying your stress with you in the form of these problems. But it doesn't have to be that way, right? It does not have to be that way. But you can see this connection between the leaky gut and the brain. It's just the chemicals that come from your gut 
are talking to your brain. Your gut either says, hey, it's a nice day, I'm relaxed, I'm so grateful, all this good food and good vitamins, and I'm rested, let's go do something fun today. Your gut goes, oh my God, I can barely get through the day. I can't stay focused, I'm inflamed. And that's, what that's the message your brain gets. So your gut, your gut talks to your brain. There's a gut-brain connection. That's how it works, okay? That's why the old wives' tale that, you know, um, uh, nightmares or night terrors are always due to, poor, were due to poor digestion. I always heard that growing up, that people who had nightmares, they have a problem with their digestive system. It's bad digestion. Well, if you think about it, bad digestion is stress, stressing the body, and the, when the body gets stressed, it releases adrenaline in the middle of the night, then you have a nightmare, especially kids. Kids, go ahead. Yes, sir. I was just going to ask, is that a food thing? Recently, I was looking at that picture on the wall and noticed there's no fat people in that picture. Oh, that's a good observation. That's a beautiful observation, and actually. I just wondered, like, did they have sleep that did no other? Is it primarily something that's come about recently? It's way worse now. Good point. I mean, we're just products of our environment. We think we're technologically, we think we're so egotistical. It's, we have hubris. We have a giant problem with hubris. We go to history class. We think about our ancestors who might have been feudal slaves in Europe. We think, how dumb could you be living in the, under control of a king or a prince? Why didn't you just go do something else with your life? And there's, you know, you used to think the world was flat and all this stuff. This, the earth was the center of the solar system. So the same hubris is here today, right? We still have the same misconceptions about the world around us. And uh, yeah, people in, this, in the 1950s, did not have to contend with GMOs. They didn't contend with the uh, chemical assault and the uh, psychological assault that we go through every day. I mean, I can't even watch TV anymore. I can't watch commercials. I can't watch the news. It just, it, it pushes buttons that don't need to be pushed. And I would recommend you just tune it out. If you need to know something, you're gonna find it out, believe me. You're gonna know, what, you're gonna learn what you need to know with your own eyes and ears. So. Yeah, and there's actually chemicals now, they call them obesogens. They generate obesity, obesogens, and like BPA and all the toxins and the glyphosate out there. We, that's a whole nother, you know, whole nother can of worms, but absolutely great observation. Look at a picture of a swimming pool in the 1950s and count how many people have man boobs and are overweight. It's not that many people. We've changed. We have changed, and stress has gotten, stress, our adrenal glands have taken the brunt of it, right? What goes on in your gut calms your brain down, okay? It controls anxiety, it controls focus, it controls memory. So you've got to work on healthy digestion. If you're going to do one thing, make one investment in your health this year, you work on your gut. You work on your gut. And that's the starting point for everybody's journey towards a healthier, stronger version of themselves. So we're going to talk a little bit about the immune system. This is the fifth sign. Okay, the fifth sign is somebody who has a cold for like a month. They have a cold for a month. It won't go away. And they get over it, and two weeks later, they get it again. And then they have it for three weeks, and then they get it again in six weeks. Well, that's never happened before. What's going on? Well, what's going on is stress has changed their immune system. Remember that stress prevents the body from investing in repair, in planning for the future, in cleaning house. Stress just pushes the body towards what do I have to do right now to make it to tomorrow? And killing viruses is not part of the program. That's a waste of energy if you're running for your life or fighting for your life. So cortisol becomes, uh, you know, we're blaming cortisol again, high cortisol. It changes your white blood cells. So you have white blood cells, everybody knows that. You know, you know you have five different kinds, I won't get into all the details, but one of the kinds are called lymphocytes. You may have heard of leukemia or lymphoma. These are cancers where there's too many lymphocytes, okay? Cortisol makes it so that your body's production of a very special like Navy SEAL SWAT team style blood cell you have, white blood cell, doesn't get made. It's called your natural killer cell and it kills cancer and it kills viruses. That's what this cell does. It kills cancer-infected cells, and it kills virus-infected cells. So when you see people who get the cold over and over and over and over again, they're getting every little virus coming through, their immune system is being disrupted by stress, okay? There's things you can do to boost them in the short term and things you can do to help that in the long term, but you need to recognize that sign. 
So the next time you hear somebody make the excuse that, oh yeah, my kids are sick. Well, you're, you know, you, you've, been, you've had the cold every, you know, one week a month for the last five months. I don't think you can blame it on the kids being sick anymore. There's something wrong with your body and your inability to fix and fight this off. So cortisol shuts off natural killer cells. That's a big problem. Again, see, it shifts your balance between your lymphocytes and your, which are your virus killing cells and your cancer killing cells and the, the other cells that, uh, called neutrophils. And neutrophils, you know, they create more inflammation. So you get less clearance of viruses. You're gonna be sick more often. Cancer cells are left in the body longer than they need to be with consequences on that end. Um, so, so all you, and remember, all you had to do is get a good night's sleep seven to eight hours really deep and you have lower cortisol the next day so that's the antidote that's a big antidote to your immune system you notice people get sick they work themselves too hard they get sick and what do they do they sleep for two days and they feel they feel better all they had to do was sleep if they could go back in time and not work so hard and have a little bit of discipline turn the computer off turn the tv off and go to bed they would be in much better shape i i purchased for my house recently a surge protector that's on a timer so I set the, the wireless to come on and go off at, come on at seven and go off at 1045. It saved me a lot, because as you just, we get lost on the internet, internet goes off, you go to bed. So consider getting one of those. They, they sell them on Amazon, it's pretty cool. So that way your, your router shuts on and off automatically and you're not gonna be up late doing stuff you shouldn't do, you know, working too hard. And then I talked a little bit already about this, but epinephrine is the same thing as adrenaline. Just, you know, what's, what do they use in you know, scientific notation? Uh, like in Europe, we call it epinephrine. And here in America, we call it adrenaline. But it's very inflammatory. So every time your blood sugar drops and you skip breakfast and you skip a meal and you get shaky, you get lightheaded, uh, you get moody, you get fatigued, you're going to be loaded with epinephrine. Epinephrine is going to cause your body to hurt. In some cases, we meet patients, and you may have experienced this before, you've had a stressful couple days, um, you didn't sleep great and you start walking downstairs and like, oh man, my knee hurts. Ah, oh, my knee hurts. Or like you feel a twinge in your ankle or a pain in your shoulder. You're like, did I do backflips and hurt my shoulder? Did somebody beat me with a baseball bat that would cause my knee to hurt? And the answer of course is no. So what changed? Well, what changed was losing sleep and being stressed out raised your adrenaline level and adrenaline makes your body hurt for no reason. So if you know somebody with fibromyalgia, maybe you have it yourself, one of the main reasons that the body hurts so much is all the extra adrenaline pulsing through the body all the time. And that's, that's it's inflammatory. So adrenal stress hurts. Um, this is just a quick, you know, aside, you know, it, this is a, a climbing trip I was on a couple years ago. That's me in the bottom and uh, my, my friend on top. And this is in the Sawtooth on Elephant's Perch. It's a pretty, very beautiful place if you get a chance to go see it. But the idea would be, you know, when you're, when you're on a side of a rock climbing 1,000 feet and taking 12 hours, you know, what if you have to go to the bathroom, you know? Everybody still has to poop. I won't get into those details yet, but what I'll say is that you can learn a lot by how you poop. And um, I had a patient come in who had some pretty severe adrenal problems. She was very fatigued. She was a pre she, previously, she was a very fit person. She was a weightlifter, a fitness competitor, you know, a bodybuilder, very strong, very competent, but she got sick. She was in a house uh, that was full of black mold, okay? She moved into this house and had no idea. Started getting really sick. I mean, like rapid heartbeat, getting dizzy, super high blood pressure, goes to the ER several times, they can't figure it out. So luckily they figure out that she has mold exposure. They give her some medication, they save her life. They literally keep her from dying. She moves out of there. That was a chapter in her life that closed. Three years later, she comes into my office. I'm talking five foot four, 125 pounds. Her cholesterol was 350. She eats perfect. How is it possible if you eat really clean, Paleo style, organic vegetables, organic meat, nuts and seeds. How do you have cholesterol at 350? How do you have triglycerides of 450? Is it genetic? Is that just a genetic problem? I don't think so. Something happened when she got poisoned by mold. And like the other patient you heard about who had a, uh, you know, the infection in the hospital that really hurt her adrenal glands, you can see that this is a, this is a picture of a, of a colon 
of an intestine with, with yeast on the inside of it. Okay? So if you have that growing inside your gut that's supposed to feed you every time you eat, that stuff eats first, and whatever it doesn't want or whatever it eats and poops out, that's what you get, right? So you get, they eat your vitamins and poop out toxins. And that's what was going on with her. So she had this chronic infection in her gut. That's actually not her gut. That's just a, a picture of, of the same problem. She had this chronic infection from almost being killed by mold poisoning. So she inhaled spores. I mean, it would have been in the water. She drank it. She got it all inside of her body. And so because of her exposure to these chemicals, or these uh, toxins from the yeast, her body produced a, a large amount of cholesterol because cholesterol is an antibiotic and it helps clean your bloodstream up from inflammation. So she was full of cholesterol and fats and her lipids in her bloodstream because it's the way the body can cleanse these garbage molecules coming from the gut. So when you see high cholesterol, the first thing you think of is gut infection. That, we know that now. I mean, her HDL was 124. Okay, it's good when it's over 60. When it's over 100, you gotta think what's going on. Something's, there's, her body's going overboard. And so all we did for one 30 days, for 30 days, all we did for this patient was we treated her gut. We didn't give her adrenal support. She, she, she had an adrenal problem, but we didn't give her adrenal support because that wasn't what she needed right then and there. We had her do a gut cleanse for 30 days. It was pretty intense. Um, she did coffee enemas every day. And as she was doing coffee enemas, she would put black coffee in. 10 minutes later, she'd go to the toilet and relieve herself and white coffee came out for two weeks, okay? So what you're seeing was the die-off of all this stuff getting out of her body. But if you, she wasn't doing the enemas, it would have taken a lot longer for her to get better. So in just 30 days, that's what her cholesterol did. It went down 30% total, 50% reduction in HDL, I mean, it's, or triglycerides. We never gave her anything for cholesterol, anything at all, except for her gut. That's it. We just treated her gut. So it was a really awesome uh, case to see, like, wow, when you have an infection that's underneath the surface, you're going to see signs of it on your blood work and you're going to see it as really high cholesterol. Even, ma even medical doctors are now experimenting using berberine to lower cholesterol. So they're kind of, that, that, that information is getting out there. And I want to share this with you that HDL is really important for your adrenal hormones. It's important for testosterone. It's important for estrogen. So when you see somebody like I saw today whose total cholesterol was maybe 250, but their HDL was like 27. That's not okay. Right? Or it wasn't 27. Excuse me. Their, their total cholesterol was 150, but their HDL was 27. So that's low cholesterol total, and the HDL is too low as a fraction of that. So that's still like a, you know, he doesn't have enough HDL to produce testosterone. Because HDL is like the UPS trucks that delivers the cholesterol to the adrenal, and it delivers cholesterol to your testes and to your ovaries to make the hormone. So low HDL low testosterone, low, low estrogen, and you're not going to make enough uh, cortisol if your body needs it. So there are now cases of patients in hospitals who have sepsis, who have an infection that's threatening to hurt them, and the doctors are injecting HDL into their body, and that's improving their survival quite a bit. So cholesterol is not a problem. It's a misconception to blame cholesterol for anything negative. It's just a it's just, it just tells you what else is going on in the body. Yeah, it's fascinating, man. It's really, really amazing. So we're just going to quickly run through hormones, hormone balance. Um, you know, we recently went through this. Uh, you know, we had our second child recently. And, you know, um, when, you, when you're working on family planning, you know, the topic of infer infertility comes up. It's getting worse. We're getting more infertile. 10% of couples are infertile. And... Um, the number one cause of that, now, you should know that oftentimes it's the guy's problem, okay? 30% of the time it's men, 30% of the time it's women, and 30% of the time it's both. So it's pretty equally distributed, but women get most of the attention, so we're going to talk to that on this case. But, you know, insulin resistance. What you see with women who are infertile is typically this. They have increased fat storage around their belly and their hip. They end up having a non-ovulatory cycle. So because their cortisol level is up, from adrenal stress. Adrenal stress raises cortisol and lowers progesterone. Without progesterone, um, she begins to become estrogen dominant. So her periods may become irregular, but when they happen, man, they hurt. They're a lot more cramping, a lot more bleeding, clotting, 
And you end up on the, on the far end, you can have like endometriosis and fibroids and things like that. Um, you also get, you'll see facial hair on women. So anytime you see a woman with facial hair or acne or male, par male hair pattern baldness, what you're looking at is insulin resistance. Just staring you in the face. It's insulin resistance. And what the problem with insulin resistance is, again, cortisol being up raises insulin. Cortisol and adrenal stress causes insulin resistance. So you take a woman and you, you, know, you, you put her through something stressful. She moves across the country with a young baby and you know, the, there's no, you, know, you have to start from scratch in a new town. You don't know anybody. You gotta go out and find a job. I mean, that's super stressful stuff. That by itself is enough to make a woman infertile. So high stress can create infertility because cortisol causes insulin resistance and um, it lowers progesterone. And what ends up happening is women stop ovulating. They still have a cycle, but they didn't release an egg. Okay, and the egg produces the progesterone. So here's what happens, right? So this is the pathway, I'll, I'll run through it. You guys have been a great audience and we're, we're getting towards the end here. But every molecule of estrogen a woman has ever made was first a molecule of testosterone, okay? Every, mole, you know, every molecule of estrogen ever made was first a molecule of testosterone and the last step is to convert it to estrogen. Now that's a, that's a chemical reaction carried out by something called aromatase. It aromatizes the molecule and boom, you have estrogen. When you're insulin resistant as a female, that aromatase enzyme is, is shut off. So women just pump out testosterone. That's what causes the masculinization. That's what causes the hair on the, you know, hopefully they don't look like me, that'd be really crazy. But I keep grabbing my chin. You get the point, right? Um, so that's what causes the masculinization. And it starts to cause this disruption in their, in their hormone system. If you see acne, you're looking at insulin resistance in a female. You're looking at insulin combined with testosterone. So, so remember in high school when there was acne was a bigger issue, was it mostly the guys or girls who had acne? I would agree, poor guys, because they got more testosterone and they're still eating the same crappy food, uh, you know, pizza, milk, and uh, you know, Cheetos, and that just raises your insulin, and insulin mixes with insulin mixes with testosterone. And that's what causes acne. Okay, women who have acne. We can work from this and say, well, women who have acne have too much testosterone and too much insulin. It's all going back to the same thing. Make sense? So, so acne on a female, insulin plus testosterone. They're getting insulin resistant and they may have PCOS. A woman with an irregular cycle who's uh, you know, premenstrual, she, or premenopausal, excuse me, she has a 90% chance of having PCOS. So it's almost, it's almost diagnostic. So the... And everybody here knows what PCOS is. Have you heard of it before? So what happens is, is basically, the, the, the cycle in a female is 28 days. The first half, the egg matures inside the egg. It gets ready to be released. And then a signal from the hypothalamus that we talked about earlier, the part of the brain, signals, boom, release uh, the egg. And then the egg is released. And then there's the, the follicle that held the egg floats down. And they go together in case there's uh, fertilization and then the follicle becomes the placenta. So what ends up happening is you have an egg produced and it matures and it just stays inside the ovary and no signal comes from the brain and then the, the, the woman doesn't ovulate. She just produces an egg and it matures and it stays inside the ovary. That's month one, month two, month three, month four, month five. It keeps going on and on and on. So the ovary just swells with these you know, half-baked uh, you know, half eggs so to speak. And that would obviously cause it infertility because there's no egg being released. And then you see on this, that arrow, that the green arrow pointing down, that's progesterone. So if a woman doesn't ovulate, all she gets is estrogen produced in the first half, and then she's supposed to become estrogen or progesterone dominant in the second half. But without ovulation, no progesterone shows up. So now the adrenal glands are gonna to try to make up for it, but they're already stressed out too. So you can just see, I mean, this is the typical female walking around. And it doesn't have to be that way. So you can see the connection between blood sugar, messing up ovulation, and now you have a progesterone deficiency. It's, it's, it's all, adrenal, gland, adrenal talks are just, there's too much information, it's crazy. 
Um, and so the good news, though, is once you get progesterone going on correctly, once you get it balanced, it helps women detox estrogen. So progesterone is the antidote to too much estrogen. It literally, it literally causes the female's body to remove the excess estrogen. So we, things like chase berry, uh, we use a lot of, like uh, we have a product that has chase berry and ashwagandha in it. Um, it helps women with, uh, you know, premenstrual syndrome. There's a lot you need, there's a lot more to it than that. But um, progesterone supplementation is really common in women who have adrenal fatigue. Adrenal fatigue, progesterone supplementation in women who have adrenal fatigue uh, is really helpful. This is a saliva test you can do, some, you know, just to show you some of the testing. This is a very in-depth test. You send four samples of saliva into a, a lab, and, and then uh, the lab's actually located in Portland, and about a week later you get your results, and it tells you whether your hormones are high or low or just right. And the reason saliva is more valuable is that when you do a, a hormone test in the blood, all you're doing is measuring how many UPS trucks are going by. You're not measuring how many are getting, delivering their package. That's all that's in the saliva is what's got delivered. You can also do genetic reports for those of you who are interested in this. It's a growing area. I think it's probably going to be really standard in 15 years, but you, know, you can get ahead of the curve and learn some stuff. Uh, we do a lot of work with genetic reports in our office, tons of research on it. Again, your genes are your tendency, they're not your destiny, but when you're trying to figure out why your body's doing what it's doing, the genetic angle provides a lot of incredible insights. It explains you know, people's personality, why people get anxious, uh, you know, why are they OCD, why do they have insomnia, and it kind of helps figure all this out. And it would also if, show you that when somebody gets under stress, when somebody goes through adrenal stress, certain genes make that stress this high, in one person, but the same exact stress with different genes makes it this high. So people who are more prone, some people are very good at making adrenaline, but very bad at getting rid of it. I'll just leave it at that. And those of you who are bad at getting rid of adrenaline probably know who you are. You probably like to keep your life more one thing at a time. You can handle big stress as long as it's like one thing, but multiple stuff coming at you, you just, that's really stressful. So when you're trying to design your life and, and be organized and, and beat adrenal fatigue, one of the things I would recommend you do is make a list of priorities and try to tackle one thing at a time and finish it before going on to the next. Okay? Because that's much more, it's much uh, more calming to have the ability to focus on one thing and get one thing done before you move on to the next. And you're going to probably surprise yourself with how much you'll get accomplished and how smart and how good you are. But if you continuously change gears and switch directions, you do a lot of things in a crappy way instead of a few things in a really amazing way. So just finish one thing before going on to the next. It'll make a difference. All right, we're getting, we're getting to the end, I promise. So we talked about some nutrition. Um, probably one of the best things you can do for adrenal fatigue, aside from sleeping, is taking uh, you know, B vitamins. B vitamins help produce energy. They give, you know, people with adrenal fatigue have a need for vitamins. Uh, B vitamins above the average person. Um, there's, there's too much for me to comment on, but uh, you know, this list is, uh, it's a long list. There's a lot of things you need for adrenal fatigue. And, and bovine adrenal glands are really helpful, glandulars. Any, anybody here ever tried those before? Yeah, so if you eat the adrenal gland of a cow, you get all the nutrition that your adrenal gland needs. Just like if you eat the muscle of a cow, you can put more muscle on. We call that meat, right? So if you eat meat, you can grow more meat. If you eat their adrenals, you can grow more adrenals. If you're so inclined, you can eat the brains and grow and get nutrition for your brain. It's, it's gross, but you know, our ancestors did it because they, they probably didn't think it was that gross. But you know, um, adaptogenic herbs like ashwagandha, I mentioned some, licorice is really good. If someone's dizzy, licorice works really well uh, to help. Licorice acts like cortisol. So if you have too much cortisol and you take licorice, you're not going to like it. But if you have low cortisol and you take licorice, it's going to invigorate you very quickly, within like 30 minutes. You know, you're going to notice a difference. Thank you so much for watching this video and sharing it with your friends and family. I personally believe, as I'm sure you do as well, that educating ourselves about what it truly means to be healthy is the only way we're going to change healthcare. I have created a website as a resource for you. 
To take advantage of this information, navigate to www.beyondmthfr.com and take a look around. In addition to blogs and articles I have written, you will find a tab on the menu labeled Protocols. It is a growing list of tools that I use in my office to help support my patients. You will find background information on common health conditions. You will find a detailed supplement protocol and you will find dietary advice to support the body's natural healing process. You will also have access to order recommended supplements at a discounted rate and have them shipped to your front door. I'm giving you the tools that I use and practice every day to help you overcome health challenges and live a happier, healthier life. I have done my best to give you that information and you will find it on these protocol pages. If you are looking for more help than simply what supplements should, should you take or what diet should you follow, I'm encouraging you, I'm inviting you to come to Boise and see me. Let me and my team and my staff take care of you. We have patients coming from all over the country and all over the area on a regular basis and there's room for you too. Now, if coming all this way to Boise is too big of a commitment, then please pick up the phone or email my office. We can work together from a distance.